Thank you for tuning in to Meaning Beyond Measure, a look between the staves. I'm your host, Ben Peterson. The purpose of this podcast is to dive deep into music, to share the story behind the sonnet, to explore the conundrums composers faced, and ultimately to discover new meaning in the music we make. In today's episode, we'll explore the Elijah Oratorio by Felix Mendelssohn. Have you ever tapped your toes to Here Comes the Bride? Or perhaps you've thrown your head back Charlie Brown style to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Well, if so, you enjoy the music of Felix Mendelssohn. Felix Mendelssohn was born in 1809 in Hamburg, Germany. His grandfather Moses Mendelssohn was a philosopher and a devout Jew. Mendelssohn's father Abraham was also Jewish, but sadly anti-Semitic laws made life very difficult for Abraham Mendelssohn. It pained him to see his children harassed and insulted. So after careful consideration, Abraham heeded his wife's counsel, and in 1816, their children were baptized as Christians. Six years later, Abraham and his wife were also baptized. And so young Felix became a Christian when he was just seven years old. Now, although their conversion to Christianity brought some measure of religious tolerance, the family didn't always experience racial tolerance. On one occasion, the Mendelssohns had a family vacation, and Felix and his older sister Fanny were attacked by some ruffians. Felix tried to defend his sister, but they were outnumbered, and both of them were stoned. Luckily, both Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn survived the ordeal, and Felix went on to compose a cacophony of captivating compositions. In fact, before little Felix was 11 years old, he completed 60 compositions, including a small comic opera. Abraham was proud of his son, but he was also careful not to push his child prodigy. Abraham knew that Mozart was thrust into the limelight as a child, and Abraham wanted his son to have an actual childhood. Since Abraham was relatively wealthy, he provided for young Felix's training, but he kept him out of the public eye so that Felix could grow up to choose his own path, unmarred by outside influences. Since Felix Mendelssohn was free to choose for himself, he gravitated towards church music, and particularly Lutheran music. Although his first few years were Jewish, Mendelssohn embraced Christianity wholeheartedly. And for Mendelssohn, no musicians expressed Christian ideals more powerfully than Handel and Johann Sebastian Bach. At that point in history, Bach had been all but forgotten. His music was no longer performed in Europe. So Mendelssohn put on several concerts to reintroduce Bach's music to the public. In 1829, the 20-year-old Mendelssohn restaged Bach's St. Matthew Passion. There was just one small hiccup. When Mendelssohn stood to direct the performance, someone had placed the wrong score on his podium. So Mendelssohn did what any of us would have done in his shoes. He conducted the entire work from memory. He even turned pages at the right time so the soloists wouldn't suspect anything was wrong. Well, the performance was a huge success. It rekindled a veneration for Bach in Germany, which spread across the globe. This performance also helped establish Mendelssohn's international acclaim. But the ever-modest Mendelssohn remarked, quote, To think that it took a Jew's son to revive the greatest Christian music for the world. When Mendelssohn wasn't reviving the greatest Christian music of Bach, he was composing the greatest Christian music of his age. It's said that one night, Mendelssohn was reading about the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings. And behold, the Lord passed by. These words in particular struck a chord with him. Mendelssohn read of the prophet Elijah, who lived in the days of wicked King Ahab and his Phoenician wife Jezebel. Jezebel introduced the pagan god Baal into ancient Israel. Then she and Ahab hunted and killed the prophets of Israel. Despite the mortal danger that Elijah was in, he confronted King Ahab and declared, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, Elijah's bold prophecy was a slap in the face to those who worshipped Baal. According to Canaanite tradition, Baal was the god of rain and storms. By their belief, only Baal could seal the heavens and cease the rains from falling. Now, scholars dispute which Baal the Israelites were worshipping at that time, 
Some believe it was Baal Shamin or Melkat. Uh, others contend it was Hadad or some other iteration of Baal. But each of these various Baals supposedly held control over the heavens and the rain. Regardless of which Baal these misguided Israelites worshipped and, and sacrificed their children to, uh, that Baal couldn't produce a single raindrop in Israel for almost three years. King Ahab was furious at this famine, and he blamed Elijah for troubling Israel. Elijah responded that the king troubled Israel by endorsing the worship of false gods. And if the rainless years weren't proof enough of Baal's falseness, Elijah issued a challenge to the king. He said, Gather 450 prophets of Baal, and 400 of the prophets which eat at Jezebel's table. And then at Mount Carmel, we'll show all of Israel whose God is God. Elijah stood alone against hundreds of the false prophets of Baal. Elijah told them to prepare a young bull as a sacrifice for Baal, and he would prepare one as a sacrifice for Adonai. Then whichever god was the true god would light their own sacrifice with fire. Now some traditions believe that Baal didn't just control the rains, but that he was also the sun god. So if anyone could rain down fire from heaven, it should have been Baal. But what followed was a Baal fail. From morning till noon, 450 prophets of Baal prayed and cried, asking Baal to set their sacrifice ablaze. Then at noon, Elijah engaged in the first recorded account of righteous trolling. He quipped, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. Then Baal's prophets started cutting themselves as part of their prayer rituals, but from noon till evening there was still nothing from Baal. Finally, Elijah prepared an altar of twelve stones and a sacrifice. He built a trench around it, and in the spirit of overkill he had twelve barrels worth of water dumped on the sacrifice and the wood. Then he filled the trench with water also. Then Elijah prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. That night fire fell from heaven. It consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the very stones of the altar, and all the water of the trench was dried up. The Israelites then fell to the ground and announced the Lord was indeed God. More miracles were performed by the Lord through Elijah, and Mendelssohn felt inspired to perpetuate these miracles through music. But sadly, inspiration is seldom without complication. In 1837, Mendelssohn asked his friend Klingemann to write the libretto for an Elijah oratorio. Klingemann initially agreed, but after a year, Klingemann decided he couldn't do it. So Mendelssohn asked Schubring to compose the libretto. Schubring wrote a libretto for Mendelssohn before, but in 1839, Schubring also bailed on the libretto. For almost a decade, Mendelssohn couldn't find a librettist. While the Elijah Oratorio was percolating, Mendelssohn made quite a name for himself in England. Berlioz remarked, For the English, Mendelssohn was a handle and a half. And indeed, no German-born composer had been so revered in England since Handel. Then Mendelssohn was commissioned to compose an oratorio for the Birmingham Festival. Again, Mendelssohn reached out to Schubring and told him that they needed the libretto and that they had less than seven months before the performance. So they feverishly began writing, composing, and casting their performers. One performer Mendelssohn chose was the famed soprano Jenny Lind. Mendelssohn loved the sound of her voice, and he tailored the soaring soprano solo to suit her perfectly. And after all that, Jenny Lind decided not to accept the role, leaving Mendelssohn to find a replacement soprano. Despite these numerous obstacles, Mendelssohn followed through on his inspiration, and he did so with a smile. One critic recalled the joy with which Mendelssohn led the Elijah rehearsals, quote, Mendelssohn's manner, both in the orchestra and in private, is exceedingly pleasing. His smile is winning, and occasionally when addressing a friendly correction to the band or choir, full of comic expression. He possesses a remarkable power over the performers, molding them to his will. 
and though rigidly strict in exacting the nicest precision, he does it in a manner irresistible, actually laughing them into perfection. On August 26th, 1846, Mendelssohn conducted his Elijah Oratorio. English tradition dictated that no one should applaud during a sacred work like an oratorio. But tradition was broken that night. Applause rained down, and eight numbers were encored. Mendelssohn was also pleased with the performers and the audience. He said, All this is indeed enough good fortune for a first performance. In fact, I have never in my life heard a better or as good a performance, and I almost doubt that I shall ever again hear one equal to it. Well, sadly, Mendelssohn's prediction was correct. The great effort of preparing Elijah and the loss of his sister exacted the last of his strength. Mendelssohn died just a year after performing Elijah at the age of 38. In the final numbers of the Elijah Oratorio, Elijah is conveyed into heaven in a chariot of fire, and Malachi's prophecy resounds that Elijah will return to the earth to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. In some ways, Mendelssohn helped fulfill this prophecy. In his vocation, he turned musical hearts and minds back to Bach and the practices of their Baroque forefathers. But in his personal life, Mendelssohn also turned his heart towards his fathers. You see, when Mendelssohn's father Abraham converted to Christianity, he changed his last name to Bartholdi. Abraham wrote an impassioned letter urging Felix to abandon the last name Mendelssohn and adopt the Christian name Bartholdi. He told his son the name Mendelssohn would brand him as a Jew forever. He wrote, You cannot, you must not use the name Mendelssohn. Dear Felix, take this to heart and do as I say. Signed, your father and friend. Despite dangers and prejudices, Mendelssohn chose to keep his last name. Clearly, he was not ashamed of his Jewish heritage. But out of respect to his living father, Mendelssohn also adopted the surname Bartholdi. Although he responded to Mendelssohn in conversations, Felix published his music under both surnames, Mendelssohn Bartholdi. In his music and his personal life, Mendelssohn treasured up the beauties of the past. For him, the past wasn't a barrier to change. It was a beam to support the buildings of the future. Like Mendelssohn, we can use music to connect with our families and our past. What music did you listen to growing up? Is there a song that your mom liked to sing around the house? Did your dad join the band because some cute girl asked him to? What study music does your sister listen to? What was the first song your grandparents danced to? And what music do you want to be remembered for? Music can be a powerful tool for unlocking memories, increasing understanding, and drawing families close together. I hope that your musical memories can turn you closer to your families and that together you'll make more musical memories in the years to come. I'm Ben Peterson. Thanks for discovering Mendelssohn's Elijah with me in this Meaning Beyond Measure.